Hello, Internet. I'm Evan Dashevsky, Features Editor with PCMag.com. Welcome to the convo. Okay, so a lot of people attempt to predict the world, what the world will be like in 5, 10, or 15 years. But let's be honest, those people are prognosticators prognostication wusses. Okay, the real game is trying to figure out what kind of world we'll be living in in a hundred, a thousand, and even a million years. This is a time when if you follow certain technological trends out, humans will become, you know, uh, immortal interplanetary cyborgs. Okay, that is the premise of the new Nat Geo series, Year Million, which attempts to figure out how technology will augment human civilization in the far future. Uh, the series is part dramatization, but also splices in commentary from various experts like Peter Diamandis, big fan, Brian Green, and Michio Kaku. Is that how you pronounce his yeah, name? Yeah, Michio Kaku. Michio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, today's guest is the series executive producer, as well as for the Nat Geo series, Mars, which was fantastic, by thank the you, way. Thank you, thank uh, you. We had Stephen uh, Petronic yeah. on to talk about that a few, a few months back. Uh, the net, he's also the EP for the uh, Netflix documentary series Abstract, The Art of Design, which my Netflix recommendation algorithm really wants me to watch. I haven't had do a it. chance to do it yet. Get in there. Okay, yes, I will, I will get in Trust there. Trust the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then as well as various documentaries for ESPN, Epix, and CNN Films, just to name a few. Dave O'Connor, welcome to The Convo. Thanks for having me. Okay, so now for those of you at home, the show is called The Convo, not The Dialogue. So if you have any questions, ask them in the comments, and social people will read them throughout the show. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact or listening to the podcast and you still have questions for Dave or about the future, too bad. Okay, so let's jump into it. Are we all going to live forever as immortal interplanetary cyborgs? We? We, yes. Probably not. Probably not. You but maybe, maybe the next generation beneath okay. us mm -hmm. or even two away from that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a lot of scientists today are working on technologies that are doing three different categories of things. One is rap, you know, dramatically extending our ability to, to live longer. They mm -hmm. do that through nutrition, advance, advances in medicines, uh, and new organs and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that piece of it. The second piece of it is genetic manipulation, gene manipulation. So we're learning more and more about how to target genes that are problematic for us to survive. So mm -hmm. that's another way that they're gonna extend life. So medicine, gene therapy. And then the third piece of it, which is really the, the transformative thing, is taking your consciousness, mm -hmm. taking your mind, yeah. and figuring out how to free it from the constraints of our biological bodies. And when that happens, that's where you really unlock the, the sort of immortality right, right. You know, paradigm. So between those three things, we are seeing a, a shift where what is now 80 year life expectancies could you know, very well be 150, 200 year life expectancies for people born 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I've been able to watch a few episodes of the series and my initial impression is that it's kind of a more futuristic black mirror, but it kind of has footnotes that kind of explain the science of, of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I don't know, is that how you describe the series? It's not how I describe it, but yeah. that's a really good description okay. of it. Okay. I think there, for people who like black mirror, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot there, and I think yeah. we, we were really inspired by that show. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to take it further into the future than Black Mirror does. So mm -hmm. Black Mirror really often looks at the very near future and mm -hmm. sort of the, what's on the cutting edge and what does it mean for us. And I think one of the things that I love most about Black Mirror and what we try to do in this series mm -hmm. as well is that it forces you to confront the what does it mean. Right. So what, not just this is cool whiz bang technology, mm -hmm. But what does it actually mean for us? And, and what should we be worried about? What should we be excited about? Mm -hmm. And what are the implications of this technology in a broader social construct? Uh, Facebook, you have a question. Is there any sort of futuristic technology you wanted to cover in the show, but it doesn't necessarily translate well to, say, you know, a television show? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff that's happening uh, in laboratories that are... Uh, if you're watching it on television, what you're really seeing is people in lab coats or people staring at computer screens. Mm -hmm. So we do have some of that in the show because that's where a lot of the action is. But we try to find technologies that you could actually see some physical manifestation of. Um, Did you I show gray goo? Yeah, there, there is some, there, there's some, there's some gray goo in there. Okay, okay. Um, I think you know gene manipulation is one where we talk about it and we, we talk about the implications of it, but we're not really seeing um, splice genes being put into other you know, animal forms in our show. But that would be one where 
it's super cutting edge and it's really transforming the next couple of decades, mm -hmm. but we haven't. Well, I want to just it. A roll a clip, and uh, Peter, are we ready to go with that? Uh, that'll kind of give people a, a taste of, of what we've got. Um, so this is from the, the opener. It's the deep future. Your body, gone. You're all computer, all the time. Your brain is way more powerful than even a billion supercomputers. Jobs, food, language, water, even traditional thought. All of humanity's building blocks, all that's done. And you are immortal. Squirming in your chair yet? You should be. This isn't science fiction. Today's visionary thinkers say it's a strong probability that this is what your world is going to look like. Tonight, they'll guide you toward that spectacular future, and we'll see how one family navigates it, one invention at a time. This is the story of your future. This is the road to year million. Whoa! Okay, so and perhaps you recognize the voice of the narrator there as Cowboy Curtis from Pee Wee's Playhouse, a.k.a.? Lawrence Fishburne. Yep, Lawrence Fishburne is a narrator throughout the series. That's super awesome. I like how you went back to Cowboy Curtis, too. Uh, yeah. A lot of people start with, with The Matrix, but sure, you sure. went well, all the way back. I there's like The it. Matrix, things like that. Can I also just share a very quick Hollywood fact that has nothing to do with anything? Is that without Pee Wee's Playhouse, there wouldn't be um, Boys in the Hood because the director on the set uh, when they were filming that was... John Singleton. John, John Singleton, he was the security guard. Security guard, set. right. I yeah, did, yeah, yeah. I did hear that. And yes. that there's, there's a lot of, you know, Pee Wee's Playhouse created a lot of it amazing things. It created a lot things. of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a great show. Yeah. And my children love it to this yeah, day. Yeah, my, I have a three-year-old who actually likes the, the original Pee Wee's yeah. Playhouse. Now, what does this have to do with the future? Nothing. <laughs> but let's get back into that. Uh, okay, so... Um, where do you stand on the uh, thing that there's a divide in, in the futurist community about AI? So you have people like the Google guys who are like thinking like this is going to help us and uh, you know going to be the savior for humanity, and you have people like um, Bill Gates and Elon Musk who are starting like you know think tanks to say like how do we uh, deal with this this yeah. evolving problem? Right. Well, AI. I mean, I think we we tackle we tackle it in the series mostly through the perspective of. AI as human-like AI. So right. how do these? How do we integrate artificial intelligence into human-like robots that mm -hmm. can interact with us and, and be there? But I think what's what's really uh, fundamentally changing the world actually today is the behind-the-scenes AI, the mm -hmm. AI that's starting to change the way that we shop, the the way that we consume content, mm -hmm. the way that uh, our products and technology speak to us and, and learn from us. So. That is something that's just, it's, it's incredibly powerful already. Mm -hmm. And there's no debate, there's no real debate about whether, whether it's real or whether it's coming yeah, or, yeah. or what oh, it's going to do. It's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think it's going to be really transformative in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think we do need to do as a, as a society mm -hmm. is make sure that we're involved in the conversation with the corporations and the governments and the university research labs mm -hmm. so that lay people actually have a, a stake and a, and a voice at the table mm -hmm. of how this technology is used. And yeah, we're, we're probably already at that tipping point where mm -hmm. we are, we're not going to be able to roll it back. Right, right. Um, so technology doesn't ever stop and it doesn't ever go backwards. Right, right. It always progresses. So unless something once, terrible happens. Unless something yeah, terrible yeah. happens. And I think, you know, with, with things like artificial intelligence, we need to be talking about how the the rules of, of how it's coded and how it starts to code itself mm -hmm. um, are are beneficial to humanity rather than oppressive. Right. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. I've got someone who's asking whether you think that pathogens on alien planets are going to pose a problem to us, and how are we going to combat them? Well, I, I have no idea how we're going to combat them. <laughs> um, I think there is, you know, the, the fundamental question at, behind that is: is there life elsewhere, mm -hmm. and what will what will it mean when we begin to interact with non-Earth-born life? Mm -hmm. And I think most scientists believe. That yes, there, the probabilities suggest that there is life elsewhere in the universe, mm -hmm. and that we will at some point encounter it. Um, I personally think that's going to be the the single most amazing thing 
uh, in the human experience, mm-hmm. and it will forever change how how our how we view our place in the universe, and and it'll be the single watershed moment that mm-hmm. that really changes everything. Mm-hmm. Um, almost a, a line of demarcation in history that everything that happened before we encountered extraterrestrial right. life. Uh, how will we defend ourselves? I think we're going to need to be incredibly cautious about how not only we interact with other planets and other life forms when we physically set ourselves there, mm-hmm. but also we're going to need to make, you know, create systems for ourselves to study, learn, absorb, and use things like the artificial intelligence Mm -hmm. to get out there and do some of that sort of predictive early stage science so that when we actually send human beings to interact with these life Mm -hmm. forms, we understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think we want to get in the business right away of going into other planets Mm -hmm. and just completely altering ecosystems that Mm -hmm. that we stumble upon. So we have to have some healthy respect for our neighbors. Right. Now, I usually ask the same 10 questions to each guest at the end of the show. I'm going to pull one of those questions out and do it a bit early because okay. um, it's, it's directly to what kind of kind of stuff we're talking about. Is um, I usually ask, will the singularity occur in 2054? Talk about Kurzweil's vision. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I think we are definitely on a path where it's possible. Okay. I think there's a lot of stuff that's happening outside of technology mm-hmm. that could slow that progress down or stop it. Um, But I do think that when you look at the advances in artificial intelligence, even over the last couple of years, Mm -hmm. even in the simple ways that that we overtly interact with AI today, there's no there's no way that 40 years down the road, 35 years down the road, it won't have advanced to that point. Mm -hmm. Um, So I personally believe that he's on track and he's I think we're heading there. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. Do you think people in the future um, acquiring cyborg-like properties will be treated as like less human? I think that's a really important question for us mm-hmm. to ask, and I think it comes down to these these baseline questions that we try to ask in the series uh, Year Million. That what is it that make us human? And you know, some people would say these cyborg capabilities are not that much different than getting an artificial hit. Right. Uh, some people think it's quite different indeed. So I, I think what we have to start asking ourselves and what we have to start understanding mm-hmm. is, is there something uniquely human? Mm-hmm. Is there something intrinsic to what it means to be human? And a lot of physicists kind of don't think there is. It's just, you know, we're all... Um, part of this global or this universal soup uh, that that moves through time and space and we don't really have free will and we don't really have anything that makes us particularly special we're just random you know colliding molecules Um, I think people that come at it from a more spiritual perspective tend to think that there is something in our souls or in our brains in our consciousness that that defines humanity and I think if you are on that side of the table, that ultimately, once you accept the differences uh, in the physical form, mm-hmm. that the fundamental things that make you human will be, will be, or, mm-hmm. you know, will still be there. So I think that ultimately we will accept cyborg-like humans as, as just part of us. Well, let's, let's talk about the cyborgs for a while. So um, uh, one of the early guests we had on the show was Zoltan Istvan, mm. who was running for the Transhumanist Party for, as a presidential uh, candidate. Okay. Okay. So uh, Zoltan's whole thing, I think his, his, his headline was something like, uh, vote for Zoltan's to live forever. Uh, so he's, he's pro doing all these sort yeah. of things and, and uh, pushing research in. I don't know. Um, let's just talk politics uh, just a little bit. Is I don't know if there's any uh, thing we should be thinking, or perhaps there is things we should be thinking about right now in 2017. I mean, I say politics because is there anything else political going on today? Hmm. No, nothing I can think of. I yeah, yeah. But um, I don't know. Do you think there's something that we should be doing, maybe even out of, outside the political realm, to prepare for these uh, inevitable technologies? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot we need to be doing, and yeah. part of what we're doing by making the show is yeah. trying to spur this conversation. Mm-hmm. And I do think that there are, you know, I had the 
what I what I consider a deep honor of working with Wired magazine mm -hmm. and uh, going down to the White House in August of last year okay. with President Obama, and I watched Scott Dadich, who's the editor in chief, was at the time the editor in chief of Wired magazine, mm -hmm. and Joey Ito, a professor at MIT, right. speak with Obama about some of the issues that we talk about in this show, and the way he thinks about the deep future and how much we needed to start the conversation really was, was heartening to me because I see these issues as if we don't start talking about them now, yeah. they will be decided by technologists, they will be decided by, at some point, by the AI itself right, without, right. Our, without us having a seat at the table. So mm -hmm. to me, that was really heartening. And I think part of all the crazy stuff that's going on politic mm -hmm. politically right now, regardless of your viewpoint, it is taking up a lot of the yeah. oxygen in the room, mm -hmm. and it's at the disservice to thinking long term. Everybody's very f focused, not just on, you know, the next six months or right. two years. Even we're we're focused on the next six seconds right. to, to, to thirty seconds, and these are hard questions for everybody mm -hmm. to tackle because they're thirty to fifty to hundred year questions. But historically, if you don't think about the big long term, the long view, when you're mm -hmm. making these political policies, then all of a sudden history takes over, or right. the future takes over, and you don't have a hand in shaping it anymore. So I think we need to pay attention to a lot of these things, specifically mm -hmm. AI, specifically gene manipulation, specifically how we're going to, uh, how we're going to build rules around those right. things to make sure that we humans are, are protected. Um, so we're talking about the show kind of goes anywhere from a century to literally I think a million years in the future. Um, what do you what kind of technology breakthroughs do you think you're expecting to see in your lifetime over the next few decades? What do you think the big thing is going to be in the next? Let's just keep the twenty years. In the next twenty years, yeah. I, I think we're going to see a dramatic shift in our abilities to eradicate diseases, mm -hmm. our abilities to uh, to change our lifespan based on health and nutrition. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a pretty substantive change in our ability to travel off of this planet. Mm -hmm. um, I think within the next 20 years, we will have human beings on Mars. I okay. think we will be thinking about wh where we go next. Uh, I think we will also be learning quite a bit about terraforming and how we're going to use technology to shift environments, mm -hmm. both on Mars, but even possibly here on yeah. Earth. So um, I think those are the things that I can see in the next 20 years that are going to change everything. I think travel is going to change dramatically on our planet, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that happen already. All right. um, so yeah, there's a lot. This, is, this world is going to look... I think people don't realize the changes are incremental that we see happening on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. and we adapt to them more quickly than ever. Right. But if you think back to the world of 10 years ago, and where we are today, it's it's transformed radically. Right. We've just adapted to it quickly, and I think that kind of the same kind of thing is going to happen over the next twenty, where a lot is going to change mm -hmm. very very fast. But our ability to absorb it, accept it, and make it a part of our lives is going to continue to increase at pace. Gotcha. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. Will we upload our brains to some sort of computer or digital storage and destroy our physical brains at any point? Uh, yeah, I think that's happening. I don't know if we will, but our certainly our our uh, ancestors, our, our the, the folks, the descendants yeah. will will do that. And I think uh, it's just a question of when. Uh, right now, there's a lot of incredible scientists, some of whom we interview in the show, who are working on scanning and mapping all of the synapses in the brain, mm -hmm. understanding not just the chemistry but the physical structures without destroying the brain, so that they can ultimately model somebody's brain. And if you can model the brain, mm -hmm. bring in all of your thoughts, memories, consciousness, and share it in a cloud, that is, to some people's minds, the key to immortality. Mm -hmm. Because once you're in this cloud, your, your consciousness will never cease to exist. Right, right. And then you're interconnecting your consciousness and your memories and your thoughts and your feelings and emotions with everybody else who's uploaded. So how does that, how does that impact privacy really negatively? Uh, how does that impact the ability, sort of the, the network capabilities yeah. of the human species? It's a trade-off. Yeah, that's yeah, a trade-off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I probably won't be around right. to see it, but 
definitely, I think that's that's coming. Definitely. Okay, so just talk about the, the show a bit more. Now, it seems to take a lot of ideas from, from science fiction, but then it explains it with science. So how did you choose um, which topics, especially for stuff that's, you know, 1,000, 2,000 years in the future? Yeah. Well, we started at today. Okay. And I think like most science fiction, where, where science fiction becomes relevant to yeah. science is that it's often the place where the first ideas are formed. Right. And you put an idea out in a science fiction book in the 50s or 60s or in a movie in the 70s or 80s, and those kids who absorb that science fiction yeah. are the ones who then make those technologies real. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm interested in is the, the notion that science fiction shapes science fact. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do in the, the show is like, okay, let's start with the science fact of today mm -hmm. and work with science fiction minds to help us extrapolate from the facts where could we be heading? Where could we be going? And it's almost this game of, you know, the show is, is to some degree a game of telephone between all these great thinkers from physics to science fiction mm -hmm. of taking each other's ideas and building upon them and just kind of drawing logical conclusions of where we could be heading. Right. Okay, so now, like I said earlier, I do the same 10 questions for all our guests. Okay, these are mostly short answers, but if, you, if you're inspired to say more, feel free. Okay, uh, Windows or Mac? Uh, I use Mac. Okay. Uh, Android or iOS? I use iOS. All right. Um, have you recently come across a piece of technology that makes you think, wow, I'm really living in the future? <laughs> um, have I recently like, come across a piece of technology that makes me feel like a... Honestly... Bluetooth headphones yeah. have changed my life yeah, yeah. dramatically. They've and got, they not, having, over the air. not yeah. having a cord and being able to talk and walk yeah, yeah. around and not get tangled up, it's that to me feels more futuristic than it, almost anything. Do you do the AirPods? I don't I don't have the AirPods. Yeah. I do I do the overhead. Good for you, yeah. yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Pods are the worst. A little, little editorial <laughs> there. Um, okay. When you're waiting in line at a store, what is the first app you open to pass the time? Uh, Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Ed Snowden, traitor or hero? I think he's a hero. Okay. Um, let's see. We did the singularity one. Okay. Is there intelligent life out there? In the yes. Universe? There is. 100%. Oh, 100%. 100%. That's confident. I like that. Confident, yes. Okay. Uh, is Bigfoot out there? No. No. Okay. I don't think so. 100%. Uh, no. I'd be like, 80%. I'm like 80% sure 80 there's no sure. Bigfoot. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, actually, let's go back to intelligent life for, for a second. 100% sure. Why have we not seen them yet? Um, I think the two reasons that we probably haven't seen them yet yeah. is that you know we're a tiny little speck on the outskirts of a very regular galaxy yeah. in a very vast universe. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is maybe they just don't find us all that interesting because they're so far advanced yeah. from us. So. Right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, what is your go-to drink at the bar? A Negroni on the rocks. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're in the golden age of television. Other than anything you're watch, you are you are involved with. What are you watching these days? Um, I'm I'm really into The Leftovers, yep, just Handmaid's finished it last night, Tale. Yep. Um, I like Fargo a lot. Yeah. So those are those are probably the three that are in the the heavy rotation on my television and the NBA Finals. Oh, which, of course. You know, very excited. Um, so let's uh, so uh, just give you a plug for a second. So this show is on Wednesdays. On yeah, it's on Geo Wednesday nights yeah. at ten o'clock on National Geographic. Okay. It's also on demand on National Geographic All the places. platforms yeah, and yeah. natgeo.com. Yeah. Um, and uh, anything else you have that you're? I imagine you're working on a bunch of stuff right now. Working on yeah. a lot of working on a lot of stuff. If you haven't checked out Abstract, yep. please do. I, I, um, I'll do that. We're just getting up and running on uh, season two of Mars, Very which cool. is exciting. When's, so, that gonna, when's that going to air? Uh, we don't have an air date yet. Okay. But, yeah, it's exciting to be even, you know, exploring the red planet once yeah, yeah. again. Very cool. Okay, so for uh, anybody who's watching this for the first time, give us a like, give us a share. We appreciate those. Uh, check out some of our past interviews. We've done a bunch of these. Uh, the Convo is an audio podcast on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, on all the places. You know where to go. Um, and also, if you like those, give uh, a like or a review in those places because that seems to help. Um, and thanks to everyone. Thanks to Social Pete. Thanks to Dave, of course. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Emmett on the on the video filling in. Thanks, Emmett. Um, and you know, we usually I say thanks to uh, p photographer Paul, but he's not here because his wife just popped out a baby. Congratulations. Wait, wait, um, Paul. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, who the baby will probably be immortal. Cyborg. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thanks to everyone, and as always, uh, and thanks to everyone who joined in the conversation. And as always, be good to each other. Peace.